But today, we are continuing our series called God's Grand Story. And in this series, we're learning about the nature of God that is revealed to us throughout the Old Testament storyline. So far, we've gone from the beginning of the Bible right to the point where the people have entered into and begun to occupy the promised land. And this was followed by a time period called the United Kingdom. Now, I didn't name that. It's got nothing to do with me talking about back home. It's just called the United Kingdom because the kingdom wasn't divided, which it comes later. It was united at that time. And this time period lasted for about 120 years, and there were three kings who reigned. And if you were here at the Walk Through the Old Testament workshop that we did earlier, uh, earlier in September, then hopefully you'll remember that during the United Kingdom, we had three kings. There was Saul, who had no heart for God. There was David, who had a whole heart for God. And then Solomon, who had a half heart have forgot. But the main character in this section of the Old Testament isn't any of those three kings. The main character is, and always is, God. And while it's these three kings who reign over the land of Israel during this time period, it's pretty clear that the one who is truly reigning is God himself. And so today, the trait of God that we're going to be reflecting on is that our God is the God who reigns. Our God is the God who reigns. And God gets to reign because everything that exists was created by him. He is the one who made everything from the vast expanses of space to the tiny atoms and molecules that form all things. He made it all, and so he gets to rule over it all. But not only did he make it, he also sustains it. He keeps it going. Colossians 1 says that in Jesus, all things hold together. And in Acts 17, Paul states that in Christ, we live and move and have our being. If Jesus wanted something to stop existing, he would just stop sustaining it, and those molecules and atoms would just disappear from existence. And so God reigns because he is our creator and our sustainer. This is why there is such an effort by some to find a purely natural explanation for how the world began. The materialist worldview is desperate to find a purely material explanation for how the world began because they recognize that if the world could only begin through some divine intervention, then they would have to owe their existence to that. But we know that our God is the creator of all things, and therefore He reigns, and He always reigns. It's absolutely impossible for us to get out from underneath the reign of God. Even if we choose to ignore him in the directions he gives us for life, we still live under his sovereign rule over all things. There is no escaping the God who reigns. But God doesn't force that reign upon us. He's not a reactionary king who destroys his enemies at the first sign of disobedience. Rather, he welcomes those who want to live in the joy of obedience to him. And he allows those who don't to pursue their own ends, even though they still cannot escape his reign. They just don't get to experience the joy of living with God as their king. And so today, as we look at the story of the United Kingdom period in the Old Testament, I want to highlight to you the stories of two kings who made opposite choices with regard to living under God's rule. And I wonder if you can guess which two kings we're going to be talking about. But before we look at these two things, we need to make this point clear. The God who reigns was meant to be the king. The God who reigns was meant to be king. Israel was meant to be a completely different kind of nation to all the others that existed. This was a nation that was established and set up by God. It wasn't established and set up by man. This was a nation that was designed to have God as their king. When God called Abram and gave him the call to be a blessing to the nations, it was this nation of his descendants who were meant to do that. Through living with God as their king, the people were meant to display to the other nations what life is like living under the good reign of God. And when God established this nation with the people as they left Egypt, he didn't create a hierarchical structure of leadership. There were no permanent leaders established in the law. There was no officers like king or president or judge. The only permanent office that was enumerated in the law was that of priest, whose chief job it was to maintain that relationship with this God who reigned. But after a few hundred years of failed leadership, even among the priests, 
the people of Israel wanted a change. And so in the latter days of Samuel's life, the people of Israel asked for something new. This is from 1 Samuel 8. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. So earlier in the year, during our Heart of a Follower series, we really looked at this passage in detail. So today, I just want to zoom in on the people's motivation and God's response. And so the people go to Samuel, who is now old and getting toward the end of his leadership years, and they ask him to appoint them a king. Sadly, Samuel's sons are not following in their dad's footsteps, and the people are tired of having a few hundred years of experience of what happens when bad leaders take over. But the primary reason that they ask for a king is so that they can be like the other nations. But this is the exact opposite of what they were meant to be. As I said a moment ago, the people of Israel were meant to be a light to a nations. The other nations were meant to be looking at Israel and wondering how they could be like Israel. But here the people of Israel are looking at the other nations and wondering how they could be like those other nations. They've got it completely backwards. And maybe they didn't think this was such a bad idea. They weren't trying to cause a major revolution. They weren't trying to overthrow the priesthood. They probably wanted the priest to continue. But they wanted a person to run the admin of the nation. And more importantly, the military side of the nation. But God had a different view of what they were doing. In desiring and asking for a human king, the people were doing much more than they realized. At the end of verse 7, God says, they have rejected me as their king. They are ultimately rejecting God. And they've done this plenty of times in the past as they've worshipped and served other gods. But now, they also think looking to a human would be better than looking to God. They probably would have pushed back a little bit. We're not trying to get rid of God, they would have said. We're, we're happy to have God in the religious parts and the spiritual parts of our lives, maybe mingled with some other gods. But when it comes to running the nation, these practical matters, let's just get a king. But God is the one who created them. He is the one who sustains their very existence. He is the one who rescued their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. He's the one who brought them into this promised land and provides everything that they need. And yet they reject him. But despite this rejection, God responds to their requests. He tells Samuel that he will appoint a king for the people. And in the examples of the first two kings of Israel, we get a clear picture, a clear contrast between someone who lives under the good reign of God and somebody who does not. So let's look at the first king, King Saul, and we'll see his heart toward God. Now, when God appointed Saul to be king, the first thing that we see Saul doing is hiding. Instead of obeying God and submitting to his call, he hid in the luggage of the people who'd come to appoint him as king. You could forgive him for being a little intimidated. You could forgive him for being a little scared of stepping into this role, especially since he would be the first king. But this was just the first of many times that he rejected God's call on his life. There was a time in 1 Samuel 13 where he was ready to go to war against the Philistines, but instead of waiting for Samuel to come to make the sacrifice and to seek God's guidance, Saul grew impatient and made the sacrifice himself, something a king was not allowed to do. Then there was a time in 1 Samuel 14 where he wanted to get vengeance on his enemies, and so he made his army take a vow that no one would eat until his, he got his vengeance upon his enemies, until his enemies were defeated. Not God's enemies, mind, but his enemies. Saul's own son, Jonathan, didn't hear about that vow, and so he ate some wild honey that he found. But when Saul found out that Jonathan had eaten something, he was about to kill him. He was about to put his own son to death were it not for the people speaking up in Jonathan's defense. Well, there was a time in 1 Samuel 15 when God sent Saul to completely destroy the Amalekites. He was to destroy everything that lived and moved and breathed. 
But instead, he decided to keep the king of the Amalekites alive and to keep the best of the sheep and the cattle to have a giant barbecue for his men. And then in the rest of the book of First Samuel, we see Saul on a murderous rampage to kill David. He tries to turn David into a human kebab with his spear several times, and he pursues David all over southern Israel to try and kill him. And Saul kills anyone and destroys any city that stands in his way. Because of this constant rejection of God's reign, God ended up rejecting Saul as king over his people. Listen to these verses. And these verses are the prophet Samuel speaking as God's mouthpiece to Saul. This is 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul had no heart for God. And so God rejected him as the king of his people. But what does it mean to have no heart for God? Saul still clearly believed in the God of Israel. He didn't become an atheist, and we don't see him offering sacrifices to or worshiping any other God. But he seemed to have little care about what God wanted or what God called him to do. God was not seated on the throne of Saul's heart, and therefore he had no heart for God. But just because God wasn't seated on the throne, don't think that it was empty. Something is always on that throne. And for Saul, it was his own glory and honor and pride. Whatever he did and all the decisions he made ultimately served this end. It was those things and not God that were reigning over his life. Our hearts, our lives rightly belong to God. He rightly deserves to reign over us and to sit on the throne of our lives. But instead of letting God reign, Saul saw God as someone who could serve his own interests, someone who could help him get more glory for himself. He didn't see God as somebody to serve. Rather, he saw God as someone who could serve him. So Saul had no heart for God. But now let's look at the second king of Israel and see a man who God describes as a man after his own heart. Now it's clear from the pages of Scripture that David was far from a perfect man. We see him being deceptive. We see him being prideful. In our staff meeting this week, Noah led us on a Bible study through 1 Samuel 25 where David almost kills a man called Nabal and his entire household because Nabal insulted him. And most famously, there's the account where David committed adultery with a woman called Bathsheba and then then arranged to have her husband accidentally killed in battle to cover it up. This was a horrendous act where David used his position as king to get what he wanted and to kill anyone who would find out. So how is this guy called a man after God's own heart? Let me give you a few snapshots of David's life, and we'll see if we can answer that question. Firstly, we see his heart attitude in his battle with Goliath. When David is trying to convince King Saul that he can go out and fight and defeat Goliath, he says in 1 Samuel 17, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And so David wants to fight Goliath, but it's not because he's proud. It's not because he thinks he's able to take Goliath down in his own strength, and nor is it for his own honor. But because Goliath has defied God, he has insulted God, he has impugned the honor of God. And David knows that the Lord is able to give Goliath, no matter how big the guy is, into David's hands. Secondly, we catch a glimpse of David's heart when the enraged Saul is pursuing him. 
On one occasion, David and his men are deep inside a cave hiding, and Saul steps into the entrance of the cave to relieve himself. And so David sneaks up behind Saul and quietly just cuts off the corner of his robe. And then when Saul is some distance away, David steps out of the cave and yells to Saul. He says this in 1 Samuel 24. Why do you listen to men? Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you've seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in that cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. We see David's heart fully trusting in God's timing. David has been anointed by Samuel to be the next king several chapters earlier. David, in many ways, was the rightful king of Israel. But he knew it wasn't his job to end Saul's life. He saw Saul as God's anointed king, God's chosen king. And it was God and only God who would put an end to Saul's life in his timing. Thirdly, we get a glimpse of David's heart and his desire to build a temple for God. Under David's reign, the city of Jerusalem became the capital city of Israel. It's where he moved and he built a palace there. And he also brought the tabernacle, which was kind of the portable worship tent, uh, to that city as well. That, and it, that's the tent that Moses built several hundred years before. But it didn't sit easy with David that he was living in a brand new palace while God's dwelling among his people was a tent that had been built half a millennia earlier. 2 Samuel 7, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. But it wasn't God's desire to have David build him a permanent temple. God told David that it would be his offspring, his son, who would be the one to build that temple. But David's desire was that God would have as beautiful a building as possible, one fitting to house the footstool of the Lord Almighty. His heart's desire was for for God to be honored and worshipped by the people. And even though God stopped him from building the temple, he spent the remainder of his reign collecting all the finest materials so that his son would have the items necessary to build. Let's do one more. This time we'll look at David's response to his sin of adultery and murder. After the events with Bathsheba and her husband had happened, God revealed to the prophet Nathan what David had done, and so Nathan goes to David. And this is a very similar setup, if you remember it earlier in 1 Samuel, when Samuel went to confront King Saul. But where King Saul defended himself and made excuses, David acknowledged his sin and repents to the Lord. And we get a real clear picture of David's heart of repentance because after the prophet Nathan rebuked him, he wrote a poem of repentance to God. And that's recorded for us in Psalm 51. Let me read a couple of excerpts to you. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So David recognized that he has ultimately sinned against the God who reigns over all. But he also knows that it's that same God who he has sinned against, that, and only that God, that can forgive him and purify him and restore him. He can only throw himself on the mercy of God and find that mercy and grace he so desperately needs. David was not a perfect man, not by any stretch of the imagination. But he was a man after God's own heart because when he messed up, he didn't excuse himself or blame others. Instead, he acknowledged his wrongdoing and clung to God for his forgiveness. And this should give us great hope. 
In this life, we will not be perfect, but we can still be people after God's own heart if we are humble in our sin and repentant and are those who cling to His mercy. While there were times when David lived for himself and there were times when David decided to sit on the throne of his own life, these glimpses show us that David is someone who strived to live with God on the throne of his heart. He wanted to honor God and he wanted to help others honor God. And when he messed up, he recognized that he needed to get off that throne and allow God to take his rightful place. David related to God, not as a God who could serve his own interests like Saul did. Rather, David related to God as a God whose interests he could serve. And that's the main difference between David and Saul. One of them served God, albeit imperfectly, and the other served himself and used used God to whatever end he needed. And our response should obviously be much more like David's than Saul's. And so since God is the God who reigns, we should be the people who serve. God is the king of the universe and the sovereign of our lives. The only proper response we should have to his reign is to bow our knee and to bow our hearts to serve him in any way he calls us to do. And so the question I want us to reflect on as we close is this. Does God reign in your life? The truth is, it can sometimes be tempting to be like the Israelites who asked for a different king. We're happy to have God in our religion. We're happy to have God in our spiritual lives. But when it comes to something more practical, we tend to let other things reign over us and tend to serve other things instead of God. Or we can be like Saul. We're happy to have God in our lives, but only to help us get what we want only to help us live the life that we want to live. We are letting some other desire or some other goal reign, and we want God to help us serve that end. And the truth is that something always reigns in our hearts. The throne of our lives is never an empty seat. If we're not giving God his rightful place, we're putting something else in that place. And instead of serving the God who creates and sustains us, We serve something else. We all serve some master. If it's not God, then what is it? And we could look at several different areas. John Calvin famously said that the human heart is an idol-making factory. But I think there is one master that we're all tempted to serve more than most. And it's a master that we don't talk about very often. And that's money. And I recognize that there's a level of awkwardness to me talking about money and the the topic of giving because my salary is paid by the money that people give to this church. The food on my table is there because people give to the church. So I fully recognize the potential conflict of interest. But I would be failing as a pastor if I didn't talk about money because it's one of the main false masters that we can be tempted to serve. Our attitude toward money is as much a sign of our spiritual health as reading the Bible, praying, serving, and doing all those other spiritual acts. And if I were to ask you about any one of those topics and how you're doing with them, there'd be no shock. Or if someone in your grow group or an accountability partner were to ask you about those topics, you'd be appreciative. But we never or very rarely ask each other about our giving and our attitudes toward money. Now, the Bible does say that when it comes to the topic of giving, we shouldn't let our right hand know what our left hand is doing. And so many people think it's a topic we shouldn't talk about at all. But in that same section, Jesus also says that when we pray, we should go into our closet, close the door, and speak to God in private. But no one has any issue with us praying in public. That section in Scripture is all about not doing our acts of righteousness to get praise from men. It isn't saying that they should be completely private and anonymous activities. And arguably, our attitude toward money is a better sign of our spiritual health because you could be doing all those other spiritual activities, reading your Bible, praying, serving, going on mission trips, whatever, and still ultimately be worshiping at the altar of your money. 
Jesus tied this idea of who we serve or who reigns in our life directly to money in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. But boy, do we try and prove Jesus wrong on this point. Let me make a couple of observations about these verses. When we talk about money, don't just think about cold, hard cash, and don't just think about the value on your bank balance. The word Jesus uses refers to all forms of wealth and possessions, including money. Jesus is saying it's impossible for us to serve two masters. We just can't do it. Our hearts only have one throne, and it's not a love seat. There is space for only God or space for only money. We cannot have both. And so the reality is that we're either going to use our money to serve God, or we're going to use God to serve money. So really, the question of who we serve is a really easy one to figure out. Just look at your bank statement. Does your money serve God and His purposes, or does God serve your money and your financial purposes? The second observation is there in verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I want you to know the order of Jesus' words very clearly. Jesus does not say, where your heart is, that's where your treasure will go. He says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will go. Our money doesn't follow our hearts. Our hearts follow our money. It's like using a carrot on the end of a stick to guide a horse. Whichever way you point that carrot, that's where the horse is going to go. And wherever we place our money, our hearts will follow. If you put your money into homes and improvements and cars and TVs and consoles and clothing and shoes and yards and restaurants and vacations and experiences and whatever else, that's where your heart will be. That's what you will love. But it's, just not, it's not just the spenders whose heart can be misdirected. If you, put your assets, if you put your money into assets and mutual funds and stocks and shares and all those kind of things, then that's where your heart will be. Imagine two Christian business th- businessmen who earn a similar salary. One earns his salary and invests a large amount of his income into stocks and shares. The other gives a large amount of his salary to church planting efforts in India. On a Monday morning, the one opens his laptop, checks his email, and reads a report about how one stock is failing and he becomes concerned about his portfolio. The other opens up his laptop, checks his email to read a prayer update from one of the church planters in India who is facing persecution for his work. He becomes concerned and turns to the Lord in prayer. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our money is heart training. The math is simple. If you want to train your heart to care more about the work of the Lord, invest your money there. And if you want to train your heart to care more about the things of this world, then invest your money there. It's that simple. These are hugely convicting verses and should be deeply reflected on by each and every one of us. And when the topic of giving comes up, Many people want to start talking about the amount. How much do I need to give to not feel guilty about using the rest? In the, in the New Testament, we're told that our giving should be joyful, generous, and sacrificial. But we're not given an amount or a percentage, probably because we would just view it as a box to check. We give that amount to ease our conscience and still serve the God of money with the rest. People will often ask if the Old Testament tithe is still applicable to us as believers in Jesus. The tithe was a requirement for the Israelites to give 10% of their first fruits of their crops and of their income to the Lord. And there is actually no place in the New Testament that declares Christians under the new covenant should still pay a 10% tithe. 
But every time the New Testament speaks about an Old Testament law, it increases the expectation exponentially. Christians aren't expected to pay a 10% tithe. The level is probably much higher. And just for reference, if you were earning 10%, if you gave 10% of a minimum wage income, you'd be given about $60 a week. I want us to start viewing the tithe as the training wheels of generosity. We start giving that 10% amount, and it feels wobbly at first because we're still learning to trust God to provide for us. But then as we do it more, it begins to get easy. We get used to it. The tithe is a good rule of thumb for early on in our giving journey, but that should not be the end goal as we mature spiritually. Just like if you're an adult and you're still riding a bike with training wheels on, you need to move past training wheels. It's not the end goal of cycling. I expect many people are feeling quite uncomfortable at this point. I see quite a few arms folded and concerned looks. Imagine how I feel, because I am too someone who desires to serve both God and money. I want to serve them both. But if we're feeling uncomfortable, it's because God is using his word to point to the throne of our heart saying, I belong in that seat. That throne is mine. And we're unsure. We don't know if we can trust God. We find security in money, whether we spend it or save it. Will God really provide for us if we are sacrificially generous? And if you think this is all just a ruse to get more money for the church, then please don't give a single penny more to the church. I would happily give you the names of a dozen Christian organizations who you could give your money to and who would love to receive that generosity instead. And so if you're feeling convicted by this at all, then here's what I encourage you to do. First, we need to repent. Gospel change starts with turning away from our sin and turning back to God. It begins with confessing to God that we have lived our lives without Him on the throne of our hearts and instead have been pursuing wealth, money, and possessions. Secondly, we believe. The message of the kingdom is to repent and believe. These are the left and the right foot of the Christian walk. After we repent, we are told, uh, sorry, after we repent, we are to put our trust in Jesus Christ. We are to trust that he forgives us through his bloodshed on the cross and trust that he is good and that he is able to and will provide for all our needs. And thirdly, we act. If we just repent and believe and nothing changes, have you actually turned away from your sin? Have you actually put your trust in Jesus and that he is better? So let me tell you the different ways that you can give here at the church. Again, if you don't want to give to the church for whatever reason, then at the Connection Center, there is a list of our church mission partners who we would heavily encourage you to give toward as well. You can always give by cash or check on Sunday mornings using the envelopes in the seat pockets in front of you um, and then just drop it in the offering baskets held by the ushers on the way out. You can also mail in checks to the church throughout the week or have your bank automatically mail one on a certain day each month. But we also have ways you can give digitally. You can visit fbclovis.com forward slash give or just click the give button on the navigation top bar of our website. Or you can open up the church app and click the give button there at the bottom of the app and give through the app. And you can either give a one-off gift or you can give a recurring gift. And let me encourage you to set up a recurring gift. With everything else going on in life, it can be easy to forget to give on a weekly or monthly basis. But if you set up that recurring gift, then you're able to obey God's call to be generous without the problem of forgetting. So I'm going to give you a moment now to do these three steps. I want you to repent, believe, and act. If you need to have a conversation with your spouse about how much to give, then just whisper to your spouse after you pray, I'd like to talk about our giving later today. But I don't want you to leave here and just forget. If you feel that conviction on your heart right now, don't leave and forget it because that conviction to follow God more doesn't always come and you can follow God and live more in obedience to his reign now. I want you to leave here with the words of Jesus on your mind. 
He is the God who reigns over all. He is the God who desires to reign over your heart, but he will not force himself on you. And he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart will follow your money. So figure out where your heart is. Sorry, figure out where your money is. And that's where your heart is. Take a moment, then I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the God who reigns over all. That you reign so faithfully and your reign is so good. We praise you that you're the creator and sustainer of all life. And we praise you that you've called us to live for you and live with the joy of living in obedience to you. Father, you know there are plenty of areas in our lives that we could talk about where we're not letting you reign. But one where most of us can relate is with money. Partly because we grow up in a culture where says, where, which says that money will bring us security, money will bring us joy, money will uh, bring us happiness. But we all know that's a lie. And instead of trusting in you, Father, we trust in the money that you've given us. And instead of using it for your kingdom purposes, we've used it for ourselves. Father, I ask that you would forgive us first and foremost, that where we've not lived with you as king, we are sorry and we repent and we trust in the blood of Jesus, that he died to pay the price for our sin of living with money as our God. And Father, I pray that you would grow in us a trust, not to trust in money and to depend on money, but to trust in you and you alone to use our money for your purposes. And I, Father, I pray that each and every one of us would be faithful, faithful using the money that you give, that we wouldn't just see 10% as a goal, but we'd see that as our starting point so that we can live generous lives, both through the work of the church, the work of other organizations, but also through our lives to be loving and generous with everything that you've given us because you've given it us to use for your kingdom. And I pray you'd convict us to do that more and more each and every day. We praise you, Father, for being such a gracious king. And we pray that we would be people after your own heart. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.